they've stabilized Greece. But in a way that you stabilize a patient who is in a coma, the fact that somebody is in a coma, okay, yeah, he or she is stable. But doesn't mean that they are healthy. <laughs> the European crisis, which is getting worse and worse since 2015, deeper and deeper, the shift to the right, to fascism, to racism, to xenophobia, the subjugation to Washington and NATO and the United States of the whole of Europe. This is one story. These are not separate stories. One story, the decline, permanent decline of Europe, and it's drifting in a reactionary, misanthropic direction. It's uh, soul-destroying what's happening. Because you see, the problem is not if only that were the problem. That is a symptom. What happens is we have two kinds of authoritarianism, two kinds of um, malignancies, if you want. We have the authoritarianism of the so-called liberal establishment in Brussels, in Paris, in Germany. They're extremely authoritarian. When I was the finance minister of Greece, I saw them in action. They talk about democracy, but they hate democracy. The one nightmare that they have is actual democracy. The people who talk about democracy are the ones who are working very hard to ensure that democracy is a system that legitimizes whatever it is that they do. But if the people, the demos, go against what they want, they just completely annul it. It's propaganda that they care about democracy. So you've got this authoritarian liberal center. And then you've got the reaction to that, which is the fascist, racist, xenophobic, ultra-right. But these two, which appear as enemies, are essentially the two different sides of exactly the same coin. They are symbiotic with one another. I'll give you a very specific example. Take the president of France, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, I know him personally. He's fine. I actually quite liked him when, when, when we used to talk and uh, exchange ideas and so on. But he's the representation of this liberal authoritarian establishment. He's, he sounds very liberal, very democratic, but he's head of a government that is, as we speak, it is um, presiding over pogroms against uh, French citizens of uh, an ethnic Arab background. They introduce laws by which they can take away your citizenship if you're an Arab uh, French person uh, without you knowing it. <laughs> no, no rule of law. This is, the, you know, this is what the ultra right are proposing. So Macron is in power. He's only in power because he's opposed to the ultra right. People elected him because he was not Le Pen, because he was not the ultra right in opposition to the ultra right. But in government, he introduces the legislation of the ultra right, and he needs the ultra right to be against him so that he remains in government to do what the ultra right wants. It's a great paradox. At the same time, the ultra right needs Macron. Le Pen should thank Macron every day because the reason why she's going, doing well in the polls is because of her opposition with Macron. So this opposition is a fake opposition. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I'm sure they don't like each other. But that's not the point. They need each other. They may hate each other, but they need each other because Le Pen would not be Le Pen without Macron. Macron would not be Macron without Le Pen. Why are the Europeans xenophobic all of a sudden? It's not that they suddenly decided that they're against the Arabs, the Chinese, the Muslims, and so on. No, it's because Europe is failing economically. You know, middle-class families finding are finding it very hard to make ends meet. Uh, they cannot see a future for their children, which is as good as the past that they had. So they're getting angry. And when the people get angry, it's really very easy for racists xenophobes, to rise to the polls. All you have to do, to do is get up and say it's the foreigners' fault, the Jews, the Muslims, the Chinese. That's the easiest way of gaining support at a time when the many, the majority, are suffering, are struggling, when you have recession. So, yes, it's been very hard because, you see, it's like between, you are between a rock and a hard place, the rock of the liberal establishment and the hard place of the neo-fascist xenophobes. And because they are supposedly fighting with one another, if you're trying to be in between and to be neither with, with one nor the other, you get squashed. And we've been squashed. There's no doubt about that. The question of, of uh, racism, I mean, in my country, in 2015, when I was in government, we didn't have any racism. You know, people were coming, refugees were coming on our shores. And throughout the summer of 2015, we had more than a million people that arrived on our shores. One million, it's a small country. This is not China, right? We are 10 million souls. 
one million arrive in a country of 10 million, that is a lot. <laughs> okay, it's a lot. And people rush to the coast, to the beach, to the coastline to assist, to help the refugees. Okay, now, eight years later, we're building walls. When it's pushing back the boats at sea, killing them. You know, I mean, there is just not even criminal negligence. There is criminal intent. Six months ago, there was a boat laden with 700 people, of whom 300 were children. And the Greek Coast Guard tried to tow them away from Greek waters in the middle of the sea. The vessel capsized. They all drowned. All. 600 out of the 700, including 300 children. So we committed that crime against humanity. Um, and people don't care. Why? Because after all those years, they've, they've lost hope, caught up between these two authoritarians. There's no doubt that we had corruption in Greece. We still do. We always did. And we continue to have corruption in Greece. But the bankruptcy of Greece has nothing to do with corruption. Uh, let me give you an example. We have a neighboring country just above us, north of Greece, called Bulgaria. Okay? Bulgaria and Greece are quite similar in the sense that we are semi-corrupt, low productivity, low investment, amongst the poorer countries in Europe. Nobody talks about the bankruptcy of Bulgaria because Bulgaria didn't go bankrupt. Why didn't they go bankrupt? Not because they were less corrupt, not because they did things better, no. The reason is the euro. We were in the euro and Bulgaria was not in the euro. In brief, when we had our own currency, the weakness of the Greek economy meant that every month the Greek currency was going down. It was devaluing because we had a deficit. We had a current account deficit, a trade deficit. And therefore, like in every country, if you've got a chronic deficit, except for the United States of America, because it's, the United States of America is a separate case, it's a different beast altogether. But for every other country in the world, when you have a constant trade deficit, your currency goes down. And that slide of your currency stabilizes the economy because it makes imports more expensive, exports cheaper, so it pushes your trade deficit back towards zero. It's a stabilizing force, the exchange rate. Also, when we had the Greek drachma, right, German banks didn't want to lend to the Greeks, but then we get into the euro in the year 2000. Bulgaria does not get into the euro. right? So effectively, the euro is the Deutschmark. Let's not beat about the bush here. It, it's not a coincidence that the Central Bank of Europe is next to the Central Bank of Germany, which is in Frankfurt. It is the same. <laughs> it's the same currency. What happened was that Germany extended its currency to Greece, which means that Germany controlled the currency. Suddenly, the Greeks become fantastic customers for German bankers. Because even though we may be poor compared to the Germans, we have something the Germans don't have. We owned our homes. 80% of Greeks owned the home in which they lived. They didn't pay rent. So you have an asset. Oh, good thing. You are an ideal customer for a banker if you have your home. And secondly, the Greeks didn't have de debt. Families in Greece in the year 2000 didn't have debt. There were no credit. People didn't have credit cards. They didn't have mortgages. They had low incomes, but they owned their home and they didn't have debt. Therefore, they were the German banker's best possible ca customer. That's what a banker wants, a customer with collateral and no debt and an income. After the financial crisis of Western capitalism in 2008, which exactly as in 1929, 2008 was our generation's 1929. I mean, the similarities are uncanny. It begins with Wall Street. There is a banking collapse. That banking collapse rolls over to Europe, to Britain, the city of London, to Frankfurt, the banks there, the banks in Paris. And very soon after that, you have a recession. You have uh, the weakest links of the chain, countries that are weakest and more prone to deficits and debts collapse, like Greece, Ireland, Portugal, then Italy, Spain. Mm? There is a domino effect. Governments impose harsh austerity on uh, the lower classes, the working classes, while printing billions for the financiers, for the banks, to refloat them, to bail them out. And that started the process of fragmenting the European Union, of Europe, of pushing our peoples apart, of turning the Germans against the Greeks, the Greeks against the Germans, you know, the French against everyone. When in reality, what has been happening is there was always a cartel of big business 
and big finance that was um, creating the circumstances for this crisis. And then when the crisis happened, the innocent people of Europe paid for that cartel. Every single German bank and every single French bank went bankrupt in 2008-2009, which means they stopped lending the Greeks, the Greek banks. And the Greek citizens, when you've taken debt, you need to keep taking more loans to repay the previous loans, to keep rolling the loans over. If your banker says, ah, oh, you owe me 100 million one or euros or whatever, and I'm not going to extend this, give it back to me now, you go bankrupt. You can't repay it all, all at once because your banker doesn't want to extend the loan anymore. So that's why, that's why Greece went bankrupt. If the European Union, if the government in Germany, for instance, were to allow the Greek state to tell the truth, that we're bankrupt, we cannot repay those debts. If we admitted that, then it would be the German government that would have to give even more money to Deutsche Bank to bail out. Now, that was a catastrophe because the money they gave to Greece, they didn't give it to Greece, the money went through the Greek Ministry of Finance all the way back to Deutsche Bank. Okay, none of that money went to Greece. None of that money went to Greece. Instead, what went to Greece in the middle of a recession was huge austerity. So we had a reduction of wages by 40% in the middle of a recession, a reduction of pensions, 40%, huge increase in, in taxes. So the economy went into a nosedive. That didn't happen in Bulgaria. Now, didn't they know that if you do that, it's like killing the cow that you want milk from. So they wanted their money back, supposedly, right? But they were killing the cow that would produce it, the Greek economy. Didn't they know that? Yes, of course they knew that. They knew they would never take their money back. They just wanted to bail out their own banks. The facts are terrible. Here are some basic facts that cannot be disputed. The country went bankrupt in 2010, officially. Everybody agrees with that. If you look at our debt today, back then it was 300. Today it's 410, our debt. Our income is today lower than it was in 2010, lower. So compared to the day we were bankrupt, we have less money and more debt. Where's the recovery? We have less investment today than we had in 2010. We have less investment today than we had in 2004 or 2002. We have um, wages that are lower today than they were in 2010 with prices that are much higher. Where is the recovery? And finally, we have lost 1 million people. 10% of the population have migrated. And these are young people, well-educated people. This is the real capital of Greece. They've stabilized Greece, but in a way that you stabilize a patient who is in a coma. The fact that somebody is in a coma, okay, yeah, he or she is stable, but doesn't mean that they are healthy. <laughs> this is why politics is, acquires such a bad name in, in, in Europe and why democracy is finished in Europe, because people don't believe in it. They know their politicians are lying to them. They are working on behalf of bankers. They are, um, even if the people elect a government like the one I was part of, to go against this, that government is overthrown because we were, I was overthrown. Imagine if a foreign power could switch off every ATM in your country. That's financial terrorism. That's what they did to us. The media is controlled by the same people who control the ATMs. <laughs> it's really very simple. It's not that complicated. This is not a conspiracy theory. But in this country, in, in my country, Take the television channels. There are five television channels. Each one is owned by an oligarch who owns the power stations. They didn't own the electricity power stations 10 years ago when I was in government, after my prime minister surrendered. These oligarchs got the power stations. They are laughing all the way to the bank. Imagine being given a power station in the middle of an electricity crisis. It's really brilliant. You know, it's like having your own ATM in your own living room. Right, And you own the television channel. Now, that television channel is not going to present something like what I said to you, because it goes against the interest of the owner of the television channel. They would be mad to put somebody like me on. And they, when they do put me on, they make sure that I'm never heard, that they always interrupt me. And then when I leave the studio, then they talk about the man who destroyed Greece and Europe and you know whatever. But that's perfectly natural. If you hand over the news outlets, to the oligarchs who benefit from the surrender of the Greek people and the European people. Well, this is the blanket propaganda that, you, that you're going to get. But it, it really is becoming laughable because, as you know, there's a terrible war happening north of Greece in Ukraine. In the last two years of this war, awful war, 
I think the news bulletins of the Greek media are very instructive, not just for here, for Greece, but also for you far away. Because you see the hypocrisy of power in full technical. I'll give you an example, right? Now, every single television channel, because they are completely in tune with Brussels and Washington, supports Zelensky, Ukraine against uh, Russia and so on. I'm not judging that. I'm simply relating it to you. They have the Ukrainian flag. People like me, I consider Putin to be a monster, but I also consider what NATO is doing in Ukraine to be a crime. The never-ending war, the endless war that Washington wants. Um, Essentially, again, Putin and the United States are need one another because they both benefit a lot from this world. The only people who lose out are the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Europeans and the Africans whose food prices are going up through the roof. Anyway, just the fact that I do not take NATO's line that we should be with Zelensky and with the Azov Battalion and, you know, the Ukrainian troop, troops must invade Crimea and they must take Moscow just because I don't agree with that because I think this is madness, <laughs> absolute madness and very dangerous for a third world war and so on. I'm being portrayed by these channels as Putin's slave, as somebody who is a stooge of Putin, which is a joke. They are so gung-ho, these channels, in favor of Zelensky in Ukraine. The same owners of those channels carry 65% of Putin's oil. (laughs) You see what I mean by hypocrisy? Their channels are Zelensky, Zelensky, Zelensky. Their tankers are carrying Putin's oil. Then they made sure that they used their immense narrative power, propaganda power, their monopoly of the media, in order to make sure that nobody outside the world hears anything about Greece, except that Greece is now fine, that it is flying high, that the economic crisis is finished. So if the problem is a European problem, the solution cannot be one based on the nation state. It has to be a European solution. In 2015, 2016, some of us realized that um, the number one priority was to unite the people of Europe, to stop this process of turning the North against the South, the East against the West, to making it clear to the people of Europe that this is not a clash between the rich North and the poor South, but it is a clash between a cartel of big business which is located everywhere. So it's it's hard to keep going, but there's no alternative to keep going. Mm-hmm.